these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. Words from today's Gospel for our Saint, Francis Xavier, whose feast day is today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Gospel here is referring to how our blessed Lord continues to work with us to accomplish many miraculous things according to our faith. It's always according to our faith. If only we had faith, we could do many wonderful things. Now, God does this primarily through his sacraments, through his priests, and through his saints. For, edi for our edification, and to see that this is true, and to see the fulfillment of this gospel that we just read, let us consider the miracles of St. Francis Xavier, as recounted by the church at his canonization which, by the way, was shared with that of our Holy Mother, St. Teresa. They were canonized on the same day. David exclaims in the Psalms, God is wonderful in his saints. Well, before we speak about his wonders, first, let's keep in mind this paradox of our faith. The more humble, the more powerful. The more humble the saint, the more powerful he is. All through his years as a missionary, St. Francis Xavier, constantly being humbled by events and other things, considered himself a failure. Listen to one of his biographers, Bishop Goodyear, S.J. We have evidence, he says, of his own deep conviction that he was himself of little worth. He himself considered himself of little worth. Now, this is why he's great, because he had deep humility. Since he did not consider himself to be great or to promote himself, no one else did either. By nature, highly strong and sanguine, he suffered from strong reactions. For example, St. Ignatius barely talked him out of heading to the Carthusians. If he was going to be religious... He was going to be the best. Endowed with talents and gifts beyond the ordinary, he was weighed down with the littleness of men around him, blocking his way at every turn. A man of broad horizons and boundless ambitions, he seemed forever tempted to depression and despair and to surrender every task he undertook the real greatness of the man must surely lie in this, that he did what he did in spite of every discouragement from without and from within, and that he died with his eyes stretched forward to a yet further horizon, counting all he had done so far as nothing, as dross. He lamented his failure to enter the and convert China, which he knew to be the key to the Far East. Those are the insights of Bishop Goodyear. Now imagine the language barriers he faced. India alone has many different languages and dialects. I went to school with many Indians in engineering, and they told me, I said, what did you think about the English in your country? And they said, well, they did two things for us. They gave us tea we appreciated that. And they gave us the English language, for with that language we could unite. It's with the introduction of English that India was able to find some unity. But he also went to various lands and islands like Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Japan, and many other places. Although he was often granted the gift of tongues so that people understood him in their native language, nevertheless, he worked hard to learn something of their language in order to pass along the articles of the faith in writing and to avoid presumption. Also, it is to be noted that he was not granted this grace of tongues, speaking in foreign languages, early on, but only after years of hard labor 
And also, this gift was not a constant thing. It would only come at times. Something to be said in regards to our modern notion of tongues. Here's a great saint, and he wasn't speaking in tongues all the time. Only on certain occasions was he granted this special grace. Now, in his bull of canonization, 18 miracles were approved as authentic. Now, here are a few. While celebrating Mass, Xavier was often so wrapped in ecstasy that those in attendance could only with difficulty rouse him back to normal consciousness. Father, we need to get to work. Please, we have to get to school. Come back to earth. At times, he also levitated about a foot and a half or more off the ground during Mass. After his arrival in the Indies, one of the more outstanding prodigies which he wrought for the edification of the faithful occurred when a mob of pagans made a surprise attack on a Christian village, intending to kill the inhabitants. These times are coming back, aren't they? But the mob was put to flight when Francis went out to meet them, accompanied by a mysterious figure whose majesty and splendor terrified the assailants. Maybe it was St. Michael. At Cormoran, when the pagans were not moved by his words, Xavier asked that a tomb which had been sealed the day before should be opened. Then, indicating that this would be a sign of God's approval of Christianity, he called the body to rise. The dead man came to life, with hundreds of natives embracing the faith as a consequence. In the same city, on another occasion, Francis healed a beggar with ulcerous legs, when in a burst of heroism he drank the putrid water, which is poison, the putrid water that came from his running sores, he wasn't affected, but grew in humility. If you know the story of St. Catherine of Siena, she was dealing with this cancerous woman and she was very difficult and Catherine was at the point of, oh, I can't take her anymore. She was attacking Catherine's purity, her virginity, and she was washing her sores and she took the bowl and she drank it to overcome her repulsion to this woman and her cancer. And then our Lord came to her and he said, for doing that, you now can drink from my side. And he opened up his side and she put her lips to his chest, to his wound, and she drank to her delight and went into an ecstasy. Also in East India, Xavier brought back to life a young man who had died of a pestilential fever as he was being carried to the cemetery, just like our Lord, with a widow of name. In the city of Kumbutura, a man, had, a boy, had fallen asleep or fallen into a deep well and drowned. His body was later brought to the surface. Francis prayed over the dead child and then, taking it by the hand, ordered it in the name of Jesus Christ to rise. Immediately, the boy returned to life. In Japan, a merchant, blind for years, was given back his sight when Francis recited the Gospels and made the sign of the cross over his head. And again, out at sea, during a storm, the landing boat of the ship on which he was sailing was torn from its moorings and lost in the waves. Three days later, in answer to Xavier's prayers, the boat floated back to the ship and rested alongside the hulk, ready for landing, as though nothing had happened. Oh, what little faith we have today. God always works such wonders according to our faith. On November 21st in 1552, Francis Xavier celebrated his last Mass. As he came down from the altar, he felt himself weakened. He tried to return to the sea to go to China. That's where he was going. But the rolling of the ship was unbearable for him. It was not God's will. Taken back to the island of Sanchin off the China coast, he spent the last days of his life half conscious. Certain of his imminent death, he raised his eyes to heaven 
and spoke with our Lord and our Lady, Jesus, Son of David, have pity on me. O Virgin, Mother of God, remember me. As he was saying the name of Jesus, he breathed his last on, at the dawn on December 2nd. He was 46 years old. To show you that he was not exactly liked in his own day, in his own crowd, when they buried him, they were so angry at him, some of them, that they took lime, bags of lime, and they poured it on his body to dissolve it, and be done with him. But when they went and dug him up, later, those who loved him, found him to be, in despite of all that lime, completely incorrupt. It carried his body back to Goa, where it is still venerated by the faithful. Francis Xavier canonized, along with Ignatius of Loyola, Isidore the farmer, and our Holy Mother, St. Teresa, on March 25, 1622, is the heavenly patron of Catholic foreign missions, along with our own St. Therese of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.